Well, thank, thank you all for coming out. Although after John's introduction, finding out how closely connected this community is with the USS Constitution, I feel nervous about what more I have to say to tell you. Is anyone here who has never been to the ship? One person's kind of timid about raising his hand. Okay, another person is. Okay. Uh, as John said, the USS Constitution is the oldest commissioned warship still afloat in the world, which is quite a distinction. The oldest commissioned warship in the world is actually not afloat. It's the HMS Victory, which is in Portsmouth, England. And the average life expectancy of a ship like Constitution was about 10 years. That is, these vessels were not built to last. They were built for a particular purpose. And Constitution, as I think, if you didn't know, you have been able to do the math since John said in 1997 for her 200th anniversary, she was commissioned in October of 1797 actually was supposed to be launched in September of 1797, but was too heavy to make it down the ways. And so they had to wait for the next high tide, wait a month. And then they also took precautions so that in October she would smooth, move smoothly down the ways into Boston Harbor. And then it took another six months to get her fit out to fight. Anyone know who the first war was the Constitution fought? No, that's a good guess. Well, okay, I hear a lot of guesses that are plausible. Um, let me, let's back up. What country specifically had Constitution been built to fight? Algiers, that's right. Did someone say Algiers? Okay. You know, in um, the summer of 1785, Algiers declared war on the United States and did this because the British consul in Algiers alerted Algiers to the fact that the American flag was not protected by anyone else. Now, Britain every year paid Algiers a million pounds and said, don't attack British ships, but attack ships who aren't British. And of course, the main country Britain wanted Algiers to attack was France. France, however, paid Algiers a million leaves every year and said, don't attack French ships, but attack other ships. So Algiers would you know, seize merchant vessels from Sweden or from Russia or Prussia or from Italy uh, and bring them into Algiers and then sell the ship, hold the crew hostage. They, what they wanted was the friends and family of the crew to ransom off their loved ones. And this was... Um, the way Algiers did business. By the way, I should mention, um, the first country to declare war on the United States was Algiers. This was in 1785. The first country to make peace with the United States, actually to declare an alliance with the United States, was Morocco. Uh, a couple of years ago, I gave a talk in Morocco, and I mentioned this fact. And people in Morocco weren't at all surprised that people in Algiers, Algiers had declared war on the United States first. <laughs> So um, anyway, summer of 1785, Algiers declares war on the United States, captured a couple of American merchant ships, brought them into Algiers, and then demanded ransom from the United States. Actually had these crewmen write to the American uh, diplomatic corps in Europe, and the closest American representative to Algiers at this time, anyone know? It was Thomas Jefferson, the American minister to France. And Jefferson was somewhat ambivalent about what to do. He thought that if the United, well, there are a number of reasons for this. One, he thought that if the United States showed a great interest in re redeeming captive Americans in Algiers, Algiers would keep capturing Americans. Every time we capture one, the Americans are going to pay for uh, pay for the ransom. So Jefferson thought pretending we didn't notice would be one strategy but not, a long -term, not in the long-term best interest of the United States. He thought what the United States should do, and Jefferson, by the way, thought a na knew that a navy is a very expensive thing. In fact, in 1785, these two, we have these two simultaneous events, Algiers declaring war on the United States, and the way they're going to fight the war is by capturing American merchant vessels in the Mediterranean, and two, 
the United States in that same year sold the last vessel from the American Navy of the Revolution. The United States knew a Navy is an expensive thing. We, are, we were broke in the 1780s, and why do we keep these big, expensive ships? We also have to man them, and wouldn't it just make sense to sell them? And if we ever need a Navy, well, we'll put cannon on a merchant vessel or hire someone else. We'll deal with that problem when uh, we get to it. And the problem does arrive in 1785 with Algiers attacking American merchant ships, holding the crews hostage, and then getting kind of frustrated because the United States simply paid no attention to this. Jefferson thought we did need to do something, and his idea was, how about we know England benefits from having Algiers attack her rivals. France benefits from having Algiers attack her rivals. Why don't we get the rivals together and organize a multinational force of the non-aligned countries to build a navy or get their navies together and patrol the Mediterranean? So uh, the Italian states and Prussia and all of these European countries with, were not Britain or France. Portugal was very helpful because Portugal was engaged in a centuries-long fight against the North African Islamic states, and Portugal patrolled the Straits of Gibraltar, which is what kept Algiers inside the Mediterranean. So we'll get them all together, and Jefferson and Lafayette and John Paul Jones are in Paris dealing with all of the diplomats from the non-aligned countries trying to create this multinational force, and Lafayette was summoned to the French foreign ministry, and the Comte de Vergennes told Lafayette, you are ordered to have nothing to do with any multinational force, well, force while, you are, are, while you are on French soil. The king wouldn't allow it. It's in France's interest to have Algiers attacking these non-aligned countries. France doesn't want the non-aligned people getting together and doing something that would upset France. So that whole thing comes to naught. And um, I could go on about this particular piece of the story, but I know you want to hear about action and not inaction. And there's about eight years of inaction. Uh, well, inaction on this front, if you're one of the two dozen sailors in Algiers, you're working on the uh, building harbor defenses in Algiers. You're doing other kinds of things. You're contracting the plague. Um, it's really a tough life in Algiers for these guys. And then, uh, of course, in the United States, thing, one big thing happening is the United States creates a government that has the power to create a navy. This is in 1789. And then President Washington appoints Thomas Jefferson to be Secretary of State. And Jefferson recognizes that the Mediterranean is critical to American trade, and the United States needs to do something to protect American trade in the Mediterranean. By the way, one thing that happens if Algiers starts capturing American merchant ships, bless you, is American merchants are likely going to stay out of the Mediterranean. That's one thing that's going to happen. Another thing that's going to happen, of course, is that insurance rates are going to go up for American merchants who do sail into the Mediterranean. And of course, the international insurance markets were, well, London was the headquarters of world insurance at that time. And you know, if you didn't know that insurance was going to come up tonight, and I apologize for that, but. <laughs> so, Jefferson knows something needs to be done, and he proposes, well, he doesn't actually propose this. He wants Congress to come to the conclusion that the country needs a navy and uh, in order to protect American trade. A lot of members of Congress say, why don't we just pay Portugal or pay someone else rather than building our own navy? There was a fear. By the way, was anyone, has anyone here served in the United States Navy? Quite a few, yes, okay. Thank you all. Um, there's even someone we're here wearing a don't give up the ship shirt. <laughs> what happens in, is in 1793, France and England go to war, and Britain as a way of, um, how to put this, Britain engineers a truce between Portugal and Algiers. The British consul in Algiers arranges a truce and issues passes so that Algerian vessels 
can get through the Portuguese blockade of the Straits of Gibraltar by showing this pass that the Portuguese government now is at peace with Algiers. And so in the late summer, early fall of 1793, a number of Algerian vessels go through the Straits of Gibraltar, show their passes to the Portuguese ships that are patrolling there, and they're quite surprised to hear about this truce. And they ultimately, the ships go back to Lisbon, and they say, we didn't know there was a truce between Portugal and Algiers. And the Portuguese government says, well, neither did we. There isn't a truce. <laughs> it, it's just the kind of thing you would expect from perfidious Albion to get Algiers to attack America. By this time, Algiers had captured about a dozen more American ships in the Atlantic. And now there are about 120 sailors captured in Algiers. You know, the United States could ignore a dozen or two sailors, but it's harder to ignore 120 sailors. So this becomes something of an issue, and this is what then provokes the Washington administration to convince Congress that it really should build, the United States should build a navy. Now, the biggest navy in the world at the time was Britain, and Britain had about 1,000 ships in her navy. It was going to be very difficult for the United States to build a navy that big. And so the ships the United States would build, we commissioned six initially, would be frigates. These are, this is a class of ship. And um, they would be essentially big enough to defeat anything smaller, fast enough to get away from anything bigger. Joshua Humphreys was the um, designer of the ships. He was in Philadelphia, and it was decided by President Washington actually, to have the ships built in six different ports. This is a way of distributing. This is a huge undertaking to build these vessels. When Constitution was being built in Boston, she was the largest structure in the city, was essentially 11 stories high. And each of these vessels being built, one in Portsmouth, New Hampshire, one in New York, one in Philadelphia, one in Baltimore, one in Norfolk, and if I am forgetting one, I'll remember it later. We'll, and I'll call John, and he'll text you all to tell you what the other one was. Th these are, this is a huge undertaking. And the, lum the, the supplies for the ships are coming from throughout the country. You know, you're spreading out the work, and you're also spreading out the purchasing of supplies. And a couple of the notable things about Constitution, by the way, today, about 7% of her is original to the 1790s. The pieces that are original are the keel and the live oak frame. Live oak is a kind of lumber that grows along the Gulf Coast and in southern Georgia and in Florida that is impervious to rot and to insects. It's a very heavy, dense wood that doesn't rot, so it's perfect for the framing of a ship like this. But if you built an entire vessel out of live oak, it would probably sink because it's so heavy. So it also has white oak and red oak and, other ki and pine and other kinds of wood, really masterfully crafted in the 1790s and actually elegantly restored today. As you probably know, she just came out of dry dock last July after about two and a half years of being refit. Roughly every 15 to 20 years, she needs an extensive overhaul and in fact, in the previous two or three restorations, they've done a lot to bring the ship back to the condition she was in in the 1790s, or actually in the War of 1812. There have been changes over the years. In the 1830s, they put a, a paddle wheel on her side. You know, this is a problem. If you have a sailing vessel and the wind dies, what do you do? And someone had this idea for a pa paddle wheel that would be hand cranked. Um, and then in the 1890s, she was a receiving ship up in Portsmouth, so there's a barn built on her deck. Looked very much different from what she looks like today or what she looked like in the 1790s or the first decade of the 19th century. So the restoration has brought a lot of her original beauty back. And the um, copper lining on her hull was manufactured by Paul Revere. Revere as you should know, um, really was a creator of an American industry. Copper rolling is something he developed here. Before Revere built his rolling mill in Canton, if you wanted rolled copper, you had to buy it from England. 
And of course, we're building a warship that is, England is now our big rival. Do we want to buy the copper from England? This raises all kinds of questions, which actually are quite pertinent today. But um, Revere builds a copper rolling mill to line the hull of the ship. Well, why copper? Well, because one thing that happens when you put a wooden ship into the water is sea worms and other kind of sea life will eat through the wood. And copper repels a lot of the sea life. So copper is really a way of protecting the hull. And Revere rolls the sheets of copper that then that are uh, nailed onto the hull to give it a certain resistance to sea life and other, other things. By the way, Revere also was rolling copper to line the dome of the State House. So we have the ship built in the 1790s for the purpose of fighting Algiers. And it takes about two and a half, three years or more to build a ship. Well, the ship is commissioned or actually ordered in 1793. She's finished in 1797. It takes a long time anyway to build a vessel like this. But in 1795, as you're probably aware, Algiers and the United States make peace. Now, immediately, when Congress finds out we don't really need to fight Algiers anymore, they say, well, why do we keep building these ships? Each one of these cost about $300,000, was equivalent maybe to about $15 million then. And Congress said, well, why are we building these if we don't really need them? And so Washington thought it was probably a good thing to build the ships, but he's also a man who cares about economy. So they put three of them on hold. They're going to finish the other three. By the way, when Jefferson became president, he had this really interesting idea as a way of saving money on the Navy. Rather than keeping these big ships, why don't you take them apart? And then when there is a war, you can put them back together again really quickly rather than having them sitting in the water where they're going to rot and so on. Well, not all of, not, not all of Jefferson's ideas were good. Um, he also, as president, proposed, well, uh, during the war with Tripoli, um, well, OK, I'll, I'll tell you about the war with Tripoli, not, rather than just going off on a tangent now about Jefferson and the war with Tripoli. Um, the con Constitution is ready to fight the war against Algiers. Well, in 1797, when the Constitution was launched, the United States was at war again, but not with Algiers, not with England, but with France. And she does sail to the Caribbean to fight against the French, does not have as distinguished a record as we might like in the war against France in 1797, 98, 99, comes back, and then is uh, the war with France ended in 1800. And she is moored in the Charles River, actually in the back bay of the Charles River, um, waiting for something to happen. And something does. At about the same time Thomas Jefferson became president, Tripoli declared war on the United States. And Jefferson wanted to send force to fight Tripoli. The problem for Jefferson in doing this was he was committed to cutting federal spending. That is, to having an economy in government, So not, not just because he was a nut about economy, but so that the United States could pay off its debt, its, the war debt from the Revolutionary War, and thus leave the next generation free to um, decide what it wanted to do and not be burdened by a debt encumbered by their parents and grandparents. Just as I didn't mean to talk about insurance, I don't know how many of you came in here a discussion of the federal debt and uh, <laughs> economy and government and other things. Anyway, so Jefferson wants to fight the war against Tripoli, but still has this idea, maybe we can get other countries to help out, to blockade Tripoli. And Jefferson believed in blockading as opposed to having naval engagements. Uh, because, you know, you, if you have a big navy or a small navy, you don't want to lose ships by fighting unnecessarily with other countries. So Jefferson does send one frigate and a couple of smaller vessels to patrol the Mediterranean and look for trouble. And the, the initial years of the war with Tripoli don't, well, 
One of the commanders in the war is a fellow named Richard Valentine Morris. I don't know if any of you are related, descended from Richard Valentine Morris. But he was the commander of one of the American squadrons that patrols the Mediterranean. And he takes his wife and their child along on the cruise. And it is very much what you would anticipate a Mediterranean cruise to be. I don't know if any of you have been on a Mediterranean cruise. But they do see all of the sights. And uh, one of the sailors writes an account of you know, the captain and his, and miss, and the, his lady sitting on the deck enjoying the sunset as they're uh, cruising around the Mediterranean. He said, a, a year and a half in the Mediterranean, and we never saw the coast of Tripoli. And poor Morris ultimately was court-martialed for this. So those of you who are anticipating joining the Navy, and I've just, this isn't going to get you far. Um, anyway, Jefferson knows something more needs to be done to protect American trade in the Mediterranean, and so wants to send the next available ship, which is Constitution. And Edward Preble, a commander from Maine, is going to take command of Constitution and make her the flagship of the war. And the first thing Preble has to do is get the ship seaworthy. She's been sitting in the Charles River, and he has to scrape seven wagon loads of seaweed off of her hull. And he wants to demonstrate to the Secretary of the Navy how encrusted the hull, her hull is with seaweed. So we know there are seven wagon loads because he loads up seven wagons and sends them to Washington <laughs> to show the Secretary of the Navy. And, and then Preble does take her to the Mediterranean. And Preble is determined to fight against Tripoli, to blockade Tripoli, to bombard Tripoli. And in, he, there now are two frigates in the Mediterranean, the um, Constitution and Philadelphia. Philadelphia is commanded by William Bainbridge. And Bainbridge had, was actually the youngest man ever commissioned a captain in the United States Navy. However, during the war against France, he became the first captain in the history of the United States Navy to surrender his ship to an enemy in this case, a French enemy, and realized that his ship was outmatched. It would be um, really suicide to engage with the French enemy. So he surrendered without firing a shot. It, he, he does recover from this. As I said, in, 17, in 1803, he's commanding the USS Philadelphia, patrolling Tripoli. Now, Jefferson wanted to fight Tripoli using as cheaply as possible. So he has two frigates, one smaller vessel, and that's it. That's the American fleet in the Mediterranean. And Philadelphia happens to be off the coast of Tripoli in October of 1803. And a lot of smaller Tripolitan vessels circle this ship, start harassing the ship, and they lead Philadelphia over a shallow patch of water, a shallow, shallow patch which wasn't on the chart, the tide goes out and she's stuck. And at an angle where her cannon can't be used against these smaller vessels that are harassing her. And Bainbridge becomes the second American commander to surrender his ship to an enemy. And he and 300 or so American sailors then are taken into Tripoli as prisoners, the ship itself was refloated, and the Pasha of Tripoli was going to use her against the um, Americans. Actually, no, he wasn't going to use her against the Americans. He was going to sell her to someone else. And Bainbridge writes back to, writes to Preble about this. And Preble, in his letter to Bainbridge, is very conciliatory and understanding. In his letters to other people, he said, I wish that he and every man had gone down fighting. Because now, Preble has to keep fighting this war with the half of his fleet now in the enemy's hands. And the, the museum, the Constitution Museum, by the way, does have letters from Preble that he wrote using uh, lime juice as invisible ink. If you hold it up over a light, a, a candle, the writing comes through. So anyway, Preble on Constitution is doing a couple of things that are going to make her the beginning of um, 
the legend that she is. One, Preble is determined to fight Tripoli by using all of the military force um, he has. And two, he has a really terrific cadre of young officers whom he is training. And, well, training may be the wrong word. He is a tough guy and an unpleasant guy and someone you don't want to be on his wrong side, but he inspires these younger officers to want to match his example. Preble had taken um, the USS Essex into the Indian Ocean during the war against France, and he is a tough, curmudgeonly naval officer from Maine. Also, his health is very bad. And sometimes if your health is bad, this makes you just stay in your cabin all the time. Other times it makes you very irritable, agitated, and always doing things. And it might have been Prebler, it might have been one of his officers who suggested that it would be a great dramatic stroke if we could sneak in, have someone sneak into Tripoli Harbor and blow up the Philadelphia. And I think my, uh, and, and uh, a lieutenant, Stephen Decatur, does this, undertakes to go into Tripoli Harbor in February of 1804, destroys the Philadelphia, creating this huge flame, f tower of flame that's visible for miles around in the desert. And uh, actually, the explosion of it sends shot into the cell in the, po in the Pasha's palace where Bainbridge is being held. It knocks the wall out from above his bed, wakes him up from a sound sleep, and Decatur becomes the youngest man ever commissioned a captain in the United States Navy. Anyway, Constitution does blockade Tripoli and in the uh, summer of 1804, fall of 1804, and then in 1805, uh, when the Pasha decides to make peace with the United States. By the way, we knew Tripoli declared war on us because in um, the spring of 1801, the Pasha notified the American consul, we're going to declare war, and the way we do that is we cut down the flagpole in front of your consulate. So he sends some guys to cut down the flagpole, and this is, of course, a signal that war has begun. Um, that particular consul, by the way, uh, makes it to Italy with a cargo of wheat and tells the American consul in Tunis that if he gets, he gets a cargo of wheat, well, He's speculating in the international grain market more, I think, than he's attending to diplomatic duties. But I don't know why I'm telling you this. You know, here I am casting judgment on people who actually did something other than you know, war people. Or, uh, and so. so Decatur destroys the Philadelphia. The Pasha decides to make peace. And as the peace treaty was being negotiated, in the captain's cabin on Constitution, the ship's carpenter was making a new flagpole for the American consulate. And so in 1805, the United States and Tripoli make peace, and the, there is a terrific painting of the American squadron in Tripoli that Preble commissioned when he got home, uh, showing all of these warships in Tripoli Harbor, and Constitution comes home from the war, and this war does more than anything that had happened in the previous 20 years of our existence under the Constitution to show the importance of having a Navy. You know, Jefferson, Madison, who was his Secretary of State, were somewhat skeptical about having a Navy. By the way, during the war with Tripoli, the United States had borrowed or leased a lot of small gunboats from Sicily, from the King of Cis Naples and Sicily. And these were really practical in fighting in Tripoli Harbor, these small gunboats. And Jefferson thinks, what a great idea, small gunboats, rather than these big, expensive frigates. And each frigate needs about 300 men. If you have a gunboat, you can have a dozen men on it. That's a lot cheaper. And really, if you have gunboats, they're good for protecting harbors and rivers. If you have big frigates, People who aren't Thomas Jefferson and who happen to be president will have dreams of sending this fleet around the world and attacking other countries, which isn't why we need a navy. We want a navy to protect our harbors and our rivers and protect trade. So gunboats really are the way to go. Now, 
these gunboats also have flat bottoms, which makes them really difficult to get across the ocean. You can do it, but it's very uncomfortable. I don't know if any of you have ever gone across the ocean on a flat-bottomed vessel. But um, so Jefferson thinks, yeah, gunboats really much better than the big, expensive frigates or line of battleships. You know, in addition to being uncomfortable, they're, you know, they're practical for rivers and harbors, but there are a lot of problems with the gunboats if this is going to be your main naval force. And one is evidenced when uh, a hurricane blows up in Savannah, Georgia, and lands one of the gunboats in a cotton field nearby. And Jefferson had a lot of critics, not just people like me, but at the time, who thought, th they thought he was a raving hypocrite. Um, some other time, maybe John will have me back to tell you more about Thomas Jefferson. Anyone here real Jefferson fans? I don't want to say anything. Oh, there's one person. A couple of people. That, this is good. I thought there would be more Federalists here in Wellesley for some reason. Uh, well, one of Jefferson, yes, sir. That's a very good question. How big was the United States Navy at this time? There were four or five frigates, and those were the largest vessels. Each one had about 40 guns on it, a crew of about 300 men. Then there were made, OK, the total strength was probably about two dozen ships at the most, half a dozen frigates, then a number of smaller vessels, sloops and schooners. Um, which would have 18 to 20 guns, and that was it. You know, 20 at the most. The gunboats, and there are going to be a dozen or so of these gunboats, um, this is going to be our main thing. And this one that winds up in the cotton field, someone said, well, like the president, it is defending the agricultural interest. <laughs> and our Navy, if she won't be the best on the sea, she will be the best on land. <laughs> so um, what happens to demonstrate, again, even more the importance of a navy was the war with Britain that um, begins, as you know, in 1812. And this is also part of the Napoleonic Wars. It's really a sideshow to the big war that's consuming most of the world. And the British thought that the American declaration of war was kind of a tactic. It was a bargaining position the Americans were taking. And the ostensible reason for the war was to protect sailors, you know, free trade and sailors' rights if there were bumper stickers at the time because the British were seizing American, American merchant ships and also impressing American sailors. What happened was this. Britain said, if you are trading, but what, First, the United States does really well when Britain and France were at war because we were selling grain to both of them. And what happened was the British and the French wised up to this. And Napoleon said, anyone who trades with our enemy, Britain, can't trade with us. And Britain says, anyone who trades with our enemy can't trade with us. And each one promises to seize any ships they find trading with their enemy. And what President Jefferson did initially when this happened was say, we won't trade with either one. And we'll shut off all American trade. And he thought that the, that the British and the French both depended on American trade. And this would bring them to their knees. It would force the British and the French people into starvation. They would, have to, they would then throw off these monarchies and establish Republican governments and put an end to war for all time. You know, Jeff Jefferson often did think grandly about what he was going to accomplish. And in this case, it really didn't do that. It didn't bring Britain and France to their knees. Their people didn't throw off their monarchies and abolish war. Instead, it bankrupts the United States. And so and it leaves to Jefferson's successor the problem of what to do with that, with, about Britain. And President Madison winds up declaring war on Britain. Now, at this time, the United States had about a dozen ships in its fleet, and including Constitution and half a dozen other frigates. And very quickly, the war goes badly for the United States. One goal the United States had was to capture Canada. In fact, here in New England, 
we would have thought all of this talk about free trade and sailors' rights is just more hypocrisy from these wacky Virginia Republicans like Jefferson and Madison who never really cared about commerce at all. And what they really want to do is get Canada, which is what they said. Jefferson said taking Canada will be a matter of marching. Henry Clay, the Speaker of the House from Kentucky, said that the Kentucky militia all by itself could take Canada in six weeks. Now, in, er, in early August of 1812, not only does the United States fail to take Canada, but a force from Canada captures Detroit. And, you know, it's not a good omen to the beginning of the war. By the way, the American general in Detroit was a guy named William Hull, and William Hull lived in Newton, Massachusetts. That's where he goes to retire. Jefferson didn't think he should be allowed to retire. He thought he should be shot as a traitor. Uh, I, actually, are, is any, uh, I did have dinner a few years ago with someone who is a Hull, and he told me that the whole thing was misrepresented. He didn't have a choice and so on, so I don't want to say anything too negative about General Hull. But um, at about the same time, or a few weeks later, Constitution was patrolling off the coast of um, Nova Scotia and encountered the British frigate Guerriere. And Guerriere and Constitution engage in a relatively short engagement, which results in Guerriere being destroyed. That is, all of her masts are taken down by Constitution's shot. And more astonishingly, the shot from Guerriere bounces off Constitution's hull. And during uh, Captain Isaac Hull, who is a cousin of William Hull, asks his uh, sailing master for a report on damage. And he looks over the side, and he sees either cannonballs bouncing off the side or stuck into the side, not causing any damage to the hull. And he says that they're bouncing off her sides. Huzzah, her sides are made of iron. And her name becomes Ironsides, almost immediately. And relatively quickly, she becomes old Ironsides, too. And so Constitution destroyed the Guerriere, brings the wounded off of her, and then sinks her, comes back to Boston. And this is a triumph. This is shortly after we had lost Detroit. Uh, Henry Adams, the historian, said that in a matter of half an hour, the ship had redeemed a nation's honor. You know, Henry Adams, the historian, wasn't given to grand uh, statements like that, but does. it's a transformative moment when Constitution fought Guerriere. And later on in that same fall, the uh, Wasp, a British ship, uh, the, encounters the Frolic, and actually the Frolic was the American ship, and I, I always get them confused. Who knows, what, Wasp, was that the American? Wasp was the American, Frolic was British, and the American wins. By the way, in the previous 30, 40 years, the British Navy had fought maybe 500 engagements with other countries and had lost maybe four or five of them. It's not a force that loses. Yes, sir? Well, Nelson had already gone to his great reward at that point. He might have seen Constitution. It, if he did, it would have been during the war against France. But it wouldn't have been Nelson who saw her. She does impress. The, these American ships are impressive in and of themselves. Um, during this, the War of 1812, um, remember, John Adams had been president when the Navy Department had been created. He had signed the commissions for many of the officers in the Navy. And a, uh, he was at, having a dinner. And he was on the other side politically from Jefferson and Madison. And someone said to him, are you surprised at how well our Navy is doing in the war? And he said, no. And then he realized that may seem like a smart, an a, sharp, sharp, a short answer. So he explained. When he had been in France in, during the American Revolution, an American-built ship had come into Le Havre, and people came to see it. And the French Minister of the Marine said to Adams, the Americans will be the world's greatest maritime power, because they have the materials that can produce ships like this. 
And Algiers had also wanted to have the United States send shipbuilders. That is, American shipbuilders had a great skill then, and it was really evidenced by ships like this. So it might have impressed Nelson, but I don't think there was ever an occasion when Nelson would have been there to engage the ship. He would have seen the ship, might have seen the ship in the Mediterranean. Uh, and there's the other episode, when Decatur destroyed the Philadelphia, Nelson was in the Mediterranean, and he called that the boldest act of naval heroism of the age. Imagine that, Lord Nelson saying that about something this American lieutenant did. So, um, Constitution defeated Guerriere, Wasp defeated Frolic, the United States defeated the Macedonian. That is, you have a number of these engagements between American ships, British ships, the Americans win all of them. And what happens after this, of course, is the British tell their commanders, if you encounter an American ship, don't engage it. Um, Constitution also defeated Java in December of 1812. This time Bainbridge was in command. And by the way, when um, Hull comes back to Boston, knowing that he is going to be replaced as commander of Constitution, and uh, the men know he's going to be replaced. And when they find out Bainbridge is the new commander, a lot of them try to get off the ship because they think <laughs> he is unlucky. But um, Bainbridge, off the coast of Brazil, encounters the British frigate Java. And another engagement, and during this engagement, Constitution's wheel is knocked off by shot from the Java. So there's no way to steer the vessel. So Bainbridge has the Marines go below, and a group of them on the uh, starboard side on the line connected to the rudder, a group on the larboard or port side, and he'll shout down which side to pull. So you have the Marines steering. He doesn't want the enemy to know the ship can't steer. It's a bad thing if your ship can't steer. It's as bad as not, being in, not having masts, and they do manage to defeat Java. And then they cut the wheel out of the Java and put the wheel onto Constitution and sink the Java, get the wounded off, and come back. So Constitution has now defeated two British frigates in single ship combat. And as I said, the British say, no more single ship combat. And in fact, the British do have a big enough navy, they can blockade the American coast, which is what they do in 1813, 1814. And, um, and then in the early 1815 Constitution, off the coast, manages to get out and off the coast of Africa, encounters two British ships, the Cyan and Levant, and engages both of them simultaneously and defeats them. This is about six weeks after the war was over, but they didn't know that. Neither side knew that the, neither ship knew, neither, none of the three ships knew the war was over. So Constitution has these three signal victories during the war. Yes, sir. Yes. Yes. That's actually that's a great question, and it's one people had at the time. The British theory was the American fleet is made up of men who deserted from the British fleet. So these are men Nelson trained, <laughs> of course. The Americans say, no, it's better ships. And in fact, during the summer of 1814, um, Stephen Decatur, who is one of the American commanders, is he had captured the Macedonian. And he not only had he captured Macedonian off the coast of Africa, he had had her rigged so that his crew could get her back to New York. And on New Year's Day of 1813, the HMS Macedonian is brought into New York as a prize. This is, boy, uh, Decatur really knew how to play. Th also, he sent a lieutenant to Washington with the Macedonian's flag. The lieutenant happened to be the son of the Secretary of the Navy. And um, happens to arrive when they're having a party in Washington celebrating the victories of the Wasp over the Frolic and the uh, Constitution over the Guerriere. And at 9 o'clock, the door opens, and there stands Lieutenant Hamilton holding the Macedonian's flag. I get chills just thinking about that moment. 
So, um, but Decatur's bottled up in New London with, Counts with Ma uh, Macedonian and United States. And there's a British fleet off the coast, and they can't get out. And uh, some of the sailors, some of the officers, start suggesting to each other, that is, American officers and British officers, for some reason, people on the coast of Connecticut were friendlier to the British than they were to um, the Americans. Is anyone here from Connecticut? OK. The blue light federalists, they called them. Every time Decatur tried to get out, someone would shine a blue light on the coast, let the British know the American fleet is coming out. But someone says, look, we have this question. How come we kept beating the British fleet? Was it because our ships were better? Or was it because our sailors were better? Well, look, Macedonian and one of the ships in the British fleet were made by the same builders. Why don't we have them fight each other? And that'll show. And, and then uh, for Decatur, he says, OK, but it has to be the crew who is on that ship right now. Because he didn't want the British taking the best sailors from their fleet and putting them all, stocking this, making an all-star team. And, the British say, no, no, say, well, you could do the same thing. And so they're negotiating about this, you know, having this duel between these two vessels. And word of it reached President Madison, who squelched it, uh, said, no, you can't have a duel just to prove which ship is better. And kind of a poor sport, but because now we'll never know. Um, but it was partly it was the skill of the builders, partly also was um, the caliber of the crew, I would think. Yes, sir. No, they were, the six frigates were built by different builders, but the same designer. Joshua Humphreys designed them all, and they all are so a similar, the same design. And one reason we know about the design is because the British captured one of them, the Chesapeake. This is where we get don't give up the ship. Uh, captured the Chesapeake. And when you capture an enemy vessel, you keep it. And you keep the name, too. And so the British took the Chesapeake. And the British are, were very good at making scale models of these vessels. And so they did a scale model of Chesapeake, which is how we now know. They also captured the president at the end of the war. Um, and this is how we know what the ships looked like inside because of the scale models the British made. Um, yeah, so similar, same plans, but different builders. Any other questions on this? Yes, sir. Did. The American Navy did learn very fast. We had a terrific caliber of officers in the early Navy, as well as crewmen, um, many from New England, and not as many British deserters as Lord Nelson thought. Uh, and in fact, some of the men who were imprisoned in Algiers or in Tripoli tried to claim they were British. And when Nelson heard that, he said, well, if they're British, they're deserters. We, shouldn't, we should hang them as deserters. That, kind of squelch the plan to get out of Tripoli by claiming to be British. Um, yeah, so um, they do learn very quickly how to engage. And in fact, they train a lot. And Decatur would argue with anyone that the real thing that wins battles is the training of the crew. And it's not necessarily navigational technique, but having a crew that is well trained. During the battle between I, and I know you came to hear about Constitution and not about um, United States and Macedonian. Um, during the battle with Macedonian, the crew on the Macedonian, this is the British frigate, cheer at one point because they see flames shooting up from the deck of the um, United States, the American ship. And they think the ship is on fire. And then they hear this feel the broadside hitting them because the crew on the United States was able to send out broadsides about you know, a minute apart, but 20 guns firing simultaneously. So if you're looking at it, it does look like a wall of flame coming up from the vessel. And that's what's going to win battles, is superior gunnery and superior practice. Any other questions on this? I thought I saw a hand up here. Yes. Yes. Exactly. Yes. Guerrier, British had captured.
Guerriere from the French. And it, I believe it was the same vessel. But then the United States built a new Guerriere after the war. And in fact, one of the uh, unique things about the War of 1812, it so convinces the American government, particularly James Madison, who had not been really a big supporter of building a navy, about the efficacy of a navy, that the United States builds a bigger navy after the war. And in 1816, late 1815, um, this newly built fleet arrived in the Mediterranean. Algiers had declared war on the United States again, and thus the United States is sending this fleet off to fight Algiers and to make peace with the other states of North Africa. And this American fleet arrived in Gibraltar. And the story is that a British officer comes down to the uh, harbor front in Gibraltar to see the American ships. And there's an American there with a spyglass. And he says, uh, tell me, sir, um, what are these ships? And uh, the American says, well, that one's the Guerriere. That one's the Macedonian. The next one's the Frolic. And the next one, the guy says, the hell with the next one. Uh, <laughs> And then the American fleet reached Algiers, and the day of Algiers says to the British consul, you had told us to declare war on these people because you were going to sweep their vessels off of the seas. Now they've come with a fleet they've captured from you. Why should we believe you anymore? And so we do learn a lot in the course of a war that doesn't go particularly well. Other questions? Yes, sir. No. Were there any of the vessels built in Bath, Maine? Um, not these. Portsmouth, yes. Um, and I'm not as familiar with, I'm sure someone here can tell us about Bath, Maine and the history of shipbuilding in Bath, Maine. And I apologize that it's not me. Um, but yeah, um, that, yes. I was there when uh, they built a lot of uh, yes. that. Yes. did. And they still are building them. So the, yes. So the American guns, not to change the subject from Bath, Maine, uh, had longer range than the British vessels. The English also claimed that the American frigates had more guns than frigates were supposed to. So most of these American vessels did have superior, had more firepower than a comparable British vessel. Um, I, I don't know, is that fair or not? I, uh, uh, we weren't playing fair, no. So. Um, yeah, so the Americans do learn a great deal in the course of these wars that don't go particularly well. And it is the skill of the shipbuilders as well as the skill of the sailors that leads to these naval victories and actually leads then to the long survival of the ship. Yes, sir. That's a very good point. And as uh, John mentioned, right now I'm working on a book about Constitution's world crews in the 1840s. And one of the big differences between the Navy of the 1840s and the Navy of this period is they had developed a tradition and an encumbrance and are much less of a team. There's a much bigger divide between the officers and the ordinary sailors. And the Navy becomes more bound by tradition and less able to embrace different ideas. You know, uh, one example of this, of course, is um, during the War of 1812, as the United States was fighting, a uh, fellow, Robert Bolton, had this idea he had been trying to push of having torpedoes, under, undersea uh, torpedoes, that is, projectiles. And this is a long story about how he gets to developing a cannon that can fire underwater and send a bomb at a ship. 
the initial idea was to have a, a mine placed in place that a ship hits. These were called torpedoes at this time. And the um, Navy figures out defenses for these things, so Fulton is trying to come up with a way to disable a ship by sending a torpedo into it. And the Navy thinks that Fulton is a crackpot. By the way, people who met Fulton would either think he's a genius or a crackpot, and most officers of the Navy thought he was a crackpot, and consequently they also thought his other idea of steam engines wasn't really worth anything. <laughs> and so they become really invested in preserving what had been and developing a tradition, preserving a tradition that doesn't lead to innovation or the kind of teamwork you see earlier on. Um, so, so that becomes a difference. And of course, the British have a much longer experience with a society, a hierarchical society, and the officers are gentlemen, the ordinary sailors are not. And um, yes, so that's a very good point. Other questions, comments? Yes, John. I think I'm pretty much wrapped up. So if anyone has questions, I'll be happy to. Yes, sir. Yes, so the question is the quality and quantity of lumber, and of course. One reason the British, the English, had been interested in colonizing North America was access for, to lumber, you know, the tall masts and things, because the forests of Europe, aside from Sweden and Norway, were pretty much gone. So yeah, it is quality of lumber here. So live oak, white oak, red oak, these other kinds of trees that are much more widely available here than they are anywhere else. And live oak doesn't grow in that many places. Yes, sir. Yes, there have been a lot of periods where we've almost lost the Constitution. The first one is in the 1820s, when you have this obsolete ship, and the Navy wanted to scrap it because they're building bigger ships, and why do you keep something around that's 30 years old? And this is what provokes Oliver Wendell Holmes to write really what's the first great American historical poem uh, called Old Ironsides. You know, Holmes was a medical student at Harvard, and I'm sure people here can recite this particular poem. No, 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 that's Walt Whitman. <laughs> I tear her tattered ensign down, long has it waved on high. And many an eye has danced to see that banner in the sky. Beneath it rung the battle shout and burst the cannon's roar. The meteor of the ocean air shall sweep the clouds no more. Her deck, once red with heroes' blood, where knelt the vanquished foe as the wind was hurrying o'er the flood and the waves were white below, no more shall feel the victor's tread or know the conquered knee. The harpies of the land shall pluck the eagle of the sea. Better that her battered hulk should sink beneath the waves. Her thunder shook the mighty deep, and there should be her grave. Nail to her mast her holy flag, set every threadbare sail, and give her to the god of storms, the lightning, and the gale. And this is what cements this ship in the mind. It's not just a ship. It is a sacred thing, and it shames the Navy into preserving her. But then you preserve the ship, what do you do with the ship? Because well, you know, I'm not just blaming the Navy. We, as people, aren't really that much interested in preserving things of the past. And so the ship was used for various things. And in the 1840s, again, the ship is on the verge of falling apart. And uh, the Navy does a uh, inspection. And they say it's going to cost $40,000 to get this vessel seaworthy. And why are we going to spend that much in something that really is obsolete? And Mad Jack Percival, a guy, he's a guy in his 60s. He had just become captain at the age of 62. He'd been a lieutenant for about 30 years. And he sees an opportunity. He's a, he's a Yankee. He's from Barnstable. Although he lives in Dorchester, he says, I could get it done for $10,000. So he does. He gets the ship seaworthy for $10,000. And then the Navy says, well, now what do we do with it? And why don't we send it around the world? And I think Percival was kind of an obnoxious guy. They were kind of hoping he wouldn't come back. 
And, but he does. And then again, what do we do with it? It becomes a training vessel at Annapolis, at the Naval Academy. And there it is in, in um, April of 1861, when Benjamin Franklin Butler leads the first Massachusetts troops to the defense of Washington. And here they find out the rebels are going to attack Annapolis and seize the Constitution. The rebels already had taken Norfolk. And the United the Navy had tried to burn some of the vessels there, like the United States, Decatur's old vessel. And what's going to happen to Constitution? So it turns out none of the midshipmen at Annapolis knew how to sail. But Butler's leading Yankee troops from Massachusetts, guys from Gloucester and Marblehead and Cape Cod. These guys know how to sail a vessel. He sends them to take the ship to Newport, which they do. So Constitution spends the war. The Naval Academy moves to Newport during the war. And then after the war, it becomes a training vessel again. A it's up in Portsmouth as a receiving ship. If you join the Navy in Portsmouth, you would go aboard what looks like a big barn. And there she is in the 1890s when the congressman from Boston, John Fitzgerald, thinks, wouldn't it be great to bring this ship back to Boston? And he goes to talk to Charles Francis Adams, who is the president of the Massachusetts Historical Society. You know, Fitzgerald, son of Irish immigrants, really liked the fact here you have this ship built in Boston that had defeated the British Empire back in 1812. And Fitzgerald finds out the ship couldn't make it from Portsmouth to Boston. It has to be rehabilitated before it can go out into the open water. But Fitzgerald and Adams work to get the ship made fit so that it can come back to Boston. It's amazing. You have the grandson of John Quincy Adams, great-grandson of President John Adams, and the grandfather of President John F. Kennedy, both in the 1890s saving this ship and bringing her back to Boston. And then it's uh, a subsequent congressman from Massachusetts, John McCormick, who has a piece of legislation making Constitution the only ship in the Navy whose home port is designated by an act of Congress. Constitution's home port is and forever will be Boston, Massachusetts. And you may recall after her sale in, in uh, 1998, um, New York immediately thought, why don't we have her come to New York and lead the tall ships into New York Harbor? Wouldn't it be great to see Constitution going past the Statue of Liberty? She hadn't even returned to the dock when New York was saying that. And there at the dock, when she came in, was Mayor Menino, said, this ship is not leaving Boston. <laughs> and so, uh, yes, in the 1920s, the ship, um, again, needed rehabilitation. And this was when school children contributed pennies for the ship, pennies to save the ship. A lot of people remember this is their first time they actually were engaged in something that is raising money for the ship. And then as a way of thanking the American people for saving the ship, uh, Captain Gulliver said, we'll take her around the country. So the ship went down the eastern seaboard into the Gulf Coast, through the Panama Canal, and then up the west coast. So to um, San Diego and to Los Angeles and Monterey, where she had been in the 1840s and then to Seattle, and then back. Um, yeah, so a nationwide tour in the 1930s. Again, there's not much left from the time of the revolution in the 1930s, so people all around the country had an opportunity to see the ship. And the museum was started in the 1970s because the ship was packed with stuff. And in, at the time of the American Bicentennial, the USS Constitution Museum was started. By the way, the ship is still owned by the United States Navy. And the men and women you see aboard her are active duty sailors in the Navy. And the commander is a, uh, an officer in the Navy. And uh, the museum is a private enterprise. It is, works in partnership with the Navy, as well as with the National Park, Park Service. But it is a private institution which tells the story of the USS Constitution. And, um, I welcome anyone to come and visit the museum, which is open by donation uh, seven days a week. Now it's from nine until six every day. And they have great school programs, and it's a great place to come and learn more about the ship.
but it's a ship that's always, as John said, always um, in need of restoration. And what has saved it over the years hasn't been the Navy as much as it has been the American people who have supported her. So, thank you. Yeah, but yeah, well.